welcome to our next ALS simulation episode on EMS Nation. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by two all-star paramedics, paramedic Sim Shane and paramedic Danny Schwester. Our scenario today is a 911 call for a witnessed cardiac arrest. Our patient that we are going to set up for you is a 76-year-old male with history of coronary artery disease who felt crushing substernal chest pressure and then was noted by a relative to pass out. Um, when that relative called 911, they received excellent dispatcher uh, instructions, checked for a pulse, found one to be absent, and then immediately started high quality bystander CPR based on the instructions they received. Now, our crew was the first on scene and they went through the appropriate algorithm, first checking for pulses, which were found to be absent, then immediately started high quality CPR by one of the partners. The second partner established intraosseous access, placed a supraglottic airway, and then also administered the first round of code dose epinephrine. And subsequently, at the next rhythm analysis, they found the patient to be in a shockable V-fib, and they shocked at the appropriate dose of electricity. They continued high quality CPR and administered 300 milligrams of code dose amiodarone. And where we next will start our simulation will be on the second rhythm check. So hang on guys, paramedics Danny Schwester and paramedic Sim Shane are coming in hot. Okay, so we're coming up on our second pulse check and uh, there's no change in the rhythm. So we're gonna shock, we're going to not uh, interrupt compressions as much as possible. So I'm going to pre-charge the defibrillator. Pre-charge. Okay, Sim, you ready? Ready. Both compressions, clear, shock, right back on the chest. If you notice, we didn't do a second pulse check after our shock, as we assumed the patient is either still in cardiac arrest, or if we use that extra two minutes of compressions. We, we note our changes once we see a change in the end title series. EMS Nation, just to jump in here, we have an excellent um, approach to our cardiac arrest algorithm here. Our paramedics are doing a fantastic job. We note that they've shot twice given their defibrillator and the patient remains in refractory VF. The paramedics are quite astute, have continued their algorithm, and have also called ahead for online medical control orders to attempt to use double sequence defibrillation, the use of a second defibrillator to shock our refractory VF. Hey guys, I got a second defibrillator. Okay, Doc, cool. Um, so in BFib, uh, we've got the CPR going for about 15 minutes. Uh, Superglottic's been placed, he's got an IO, two FBs and three other the other room right now. No change. Fair enough. And it looks like you guys are approaching your third rhythm check? About five or ten seconds. All right, amazing. So shall we place the second set of defibrillator pads on the next rhythm analysis? Yeah, we'll, I think that's the deal. Let's do that. All right, so the way we'll do it is we'll pre-charge our defibrillator. And if you all are ready, we'll do a three, two, one, turn. Okay. Three, two, one, turn. Okay, back pads on. Front pads on. Feeling DF, clear, shock. Right back on the chest. Okay. Excellent. Hey, everybody. So, we're continuing along the ACLS algorithm for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. We have given the appropriate co-dose medications, and as we approach our third rhythm check, we have both defibrillator pads connected to our patient because the clinical scenario has turned into a refractory VF. We've already went ahead and called for online medical control orders for double sequence defibrillation, and on our next rhythm check, we will preemptively charge both devices, and if our patient remains in a shockable rhythm, we will discharge both near simultaneously. So 
let's take a moment and charge both devices to the maximum amount of energy allowed. While continuing high quality CPR. Danny, are you getting ready? Ready. We'll do a three, two, one shot when Sim is off the chest. And clear. Three, two, one shot. Right back onto the chest. So after our fourth defibrillation, which we used a double sequential technique, we noticed our end title shot up to into the 40s. On our next pulse check, we noted that we had a pulsatile rhythm and an organized complex on the monitor. So we have ROSC. Our next goal is to make sure that we have a good airway, uh, get a set of vital signs, and make sure that we're, we're uh, able to start post-resuscitation care as the AHA guidelines. We're on the way to the hospital, we're going to do a 12 lead, we're going to continue to support perfusion as needed, and we're going to look to transport to a hospital that's capable of doing PCI. I'm going to focus for a minute on what I came here to talk about, double defibrillation, because I believe this is kind of the wave of the future. And I'm not sure we figured out the holy grail and how to improve our survivor rates even more dramatically than we have, but I think we're getting freaking close. So here are our Twitter accounts. You can follow us, you can write down your email for me, we'll put you on our weekly email list. I am the System Medical Director, Chief Medical Officer for MAMA, no disclosures. And basically, here's what we're freaking doing. So I'm going to say something wrong, and then I'll explain why it's wrong. We are taking 720 joules and shocking people who are in VFIP arrest on a regular basis. Now, the reason it's wrong is it's not really 720 joules. It's really 360 times 2. So we're taking two defibrillators. Every one of our ALS units carries two defibrillators. We're taking both of them for VFib, and we're basically hitting the buttons close to simultaneously with four pads. We're not the first people to do this, but we're the people with the largest database to do this, and we do this on a regular basis. I'll talk about what we do. So here's our pad placement. We do one anterior posterior, then anterior lateral. We are big believers. This is going to freak you out. Hold on to your seats. Are you ready? Are you ready? And hands on defibrillation. I have learned three things from the literature this year. Certainly, when a defibrillator is charging, you got to be doing CPR. We all know that. Should you do CPR when the machine is analyzing? Well, you've probably heard other lectures about this. This is called see through CPR. There's some great papers out there. I didn't write any of those papers. But we're getting there. We're slowly getting there where we can do better CPR while the machine is analyzing. And the future will be that we'll all be able to do it. We're not quite there yet with most products. Even most of the companies here have written like lots of position statements. People have reviewed it. We're getting better and better and better. And the future will be we'll all be doing it. The third thing is, what about keeping your hands on the chest while the machine is shocking? And many people have written articles, the end of clear, all clear. First of all, if you're bagging the patient, you really don't need to let go of the bag and go back 20 feet, right? That's kind of a myth. And hopefully you're barely bagging the patient. But we have docs, we show them the literature, we give them the signs, and we say you've got to do three things. One, you have to double glove. Because there is some literature out there which says there's less incidence of getting shot through double glove. Two, most of the people who got shot were in the old days when we all used paddles, not pads. And three, the second pad really needs to be lateral. If they're both anterior or close to being anterior, you run the risk. And when they've actually done studies to show none of that exists, the number of people who got shot from hands on defibrillation was 0%. 0%. This is not me talking, this is the literature. So I don't make anybody do this because there's lots of lawyers in the world, right? And I'm not dumb. What I do is I show them the literature, and with that being said, some people like to shop, uh, do hands-on Dr. Arshad, does hands-on almost every day, when we do uh, cerebellar testing on him at the end of every week, things of the nose, he'll the shin, and, uh, and he's doing okay, in fact, he cured his depression, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is like really, really good, and I don't make people do it, but I have one paramedic who's also a lawyer, and that person like keeps their hands on all the time. Um, so, so th th these are just kind of some, some things we do. So, four pads, right, anterior, posterior, anterior, lateral, and we do this after three shocks. So, Wake County, we basically stood on the, we, we stood on the shoulders of giants. Wake County started doing this years ago, and in 2015, they published their results. They were able to get about 10 patients, but it took them a couple of years. 
And the reason being, again, this amazing thing, the reason being is that they don't have two defibrillators in every ambulance, right? We do. So that's how we can collect 60 patients per year. So just think about this. 2016 almost, I would say, based upon the literature, we have no idea how many tools to shop the patient at. Because if we know in pediatrics, you start at two joules per kilo, and then you go to four, why is that? Why not five? Why not eight? Why not 12? The answer is, because in most things in medicine, we totally make it up. Because you can't just tell people and kids, just do what you think is best. You have to have a number, right? But why is it when you become 13 or 18 or 21, all of a sudden something magical happens and we shop at adult jewels? Why isn't it based upon body habits? And maybe it should be. Maybe it should be. So maybe we're showing improved survival rates because we're using more energy, right? However, maybe it's because we're adding extra vectors to the myocardium. Because when you look at this, most people's PMI, point of maximal impulse intensity, is actually displaced. We're actually doing continuous ultrasound with cardiac arrest now in the ED. We're starting to do a pre-hospital with our fellows, and we're compressing where the PMI is, right? So sometimes we have survivor rates, great survivor rates, based upon where the PMI is. If it's lateral to the sternum, it's lateral to the sternum, right? And we're not pressing right of the sternum, we're pressing with the PMI. It just kind of makes sense. So this is an extra vector. Joe Ornato out of Cerebral College of Virginia studied this in dogs years ago, and he used 12, 15 pads, like all this stuff to do extra vectors. So is this more, is this more that it's more joules or more that it's more vectors to the myocardium? Well, nobody knows the answer to this. I discussed this with Paul Pepe a while ago, and he was saying, or yesterday, and he thinks it's both, and I think it is both, I'm not really sure. I just know it's pretty cool. And let me tell you a couple of things about this. One is we're telling our doctors that when they give orders to the paramedics, it's after three refractory single VFs, which means you shot people normally, and if they don't convert after three, then we take two defibrillators and we do the 720 joules, again, really 360 times two, hitting both buttons simultaneously, four pads. Wait, County did five. I don't know if any of this is the right answer. Maybe we should be doing this on everybody. Maybe we should be judging body habits and taking it. Now, we know the time to convert uh, V-fib is really important, right? And the longer you stay in V-fib, the less likely you'll have a survival. But we also know that converting people with the lowest amount of energy is really important, too. So we got to figure out how much to defibrillate people at because we really have no idea. But you've all had those cases where you've had people like in perfect VF and you keep shocking them with single defibrillators over and over and nothing happens. So our first two cases, believe this or not, the first one was a pre-hospital patient who was in their 40s who got eight single defibrillations, nothing happened. One double sequence, the guy woke up, went to the cath lab, got discharged. He would have been pronounced dead. The second patient was in the hospital. We were just training to do this pre hospitally and it was a resident that we were training. He ran into a code in the hospital. It was a code right in the cardiology wing. Everybody was there. He said, listen, it's been like 10 single defibrillations. Why don't we try a second defibrillator? Nobody had ever heard of this. It was right in the cardiology suite. They put on the second defibrillator. One shot, the guy woke up and they got intubated and got discharged the next day after the cath lab. This patient would have died, would have been pronounced. Right, the anti CO2 at that point was terrible. And we basically, I'll show you some of our numbers, are seeing improved survival rates in people with refractory VF. But maybe in people who are with big body hazards, we should be doing this right away. Right? We don't know how much to shock people at. Why are kids two to four joules per kilo and adults, we just go to our normal adult doses? We don't know. The old defibrillators used to be more joules. We, we, we just don't know the answer. And this is what we're trying to figure out. So we stood on the shoulders of giants. Several people have published papers. There's a paper going back to 1994. There are case reports in the literature of people doing this. But nobody really followed through with this very well. And again, Wake County published some of their data. But, you know, the, it, it just takes them a while to get numbers because they're doing it after five and don't have easy access to do two defibrillators. We just sent in our first 10 cases. And again, this is what we call this an alternate, but I think not believe this is but it's somehow be the primary way we're going to shock people in the future. And here's the basic indication. So we count AED. So if BLS gets there, somebody puts an AED on and shocks them twice, that means ALS can get there and do one single defibrillation, and then we'll start double uh, exact right away after three. 
22 cases since October 2014, really just one or two in the first couple of months, and then we sort of just kind of took off and started doing it a lot. We have to pay 60 per year. We report the first data, we'll hear in the journal soon, and this is, and this is basically some of the first eight cases. The one problem we had is people are sometimes like all new interventions, people are forgetting to do this after three. So sometimes we're seeing it after five, sometimes we're seeing it after ten. And we're actually finding that once you do it after seven, it really doesn't matter after seven because nobody's going to survive, uh, for the most part, by a defibrillation or not defibrillation. For dying in the emergency department, so our survival rate was about 50%, 50%. Um, and the VF conversion was in five cases. So basically, five cases where multiple single defibrillations failed, one double defibrillation, and the patient converted out of the VF. Pretty interesting. 